Hello again. This is part four now of our series. In this um, part, he starts to go into the teachings of Paul. So enjoy. This is a very good one, I think. Why was Abraham chosen as the first Jew? Now, the New Testament gives its reason for why they believe that Abraham was chosen as the first Jew. This is a quote from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Galatians was a book written by Paul. And he writes the following, Even so, and when I'm going to be quoting tonight from the Christian Bible, whenever the Christian Bible quotes the Jewish Bible, I put that in italics. So Paul says, even so, and now he quotes from the Jewish Bible, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him, it was considered to him as righteousness. That's a verse in Genesis chapter 15. So Paul is, is seizing upon this verse, where the verse says that Abraham believed, and that belief was considered to be righteousness. So Paul says, therefore, to be sure that it is to those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Paul says, who are the sons of Abraham? People that have faith. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. So Paul now says, So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many are, as the, for as many are of the works of the law, meaning those people who put their emphasis not on faith, I believe, but people who put their emphasis on following the Torah, observing the commandments, what Paul calls the law. He says those people are under a curse. So here in this paragraph, what you see happening is a major theme in the writings of the New Testament. They contrast the relative importance of faith, which basically means for them, belief in the Messiah. I believe in the Messiah. Because what happens in Christianity is that the observance of the Torah gets replaced by faith in the Messiah. For them, it's Jesus. So here, Paul is contrasting the relative importance of keeping the Torah, observing the commandments, versus faith. And he says, you see, by Abraham, what did God consider to be righteousness? Abraham's faith. So Paul says that's why Abraham is really chosen because of his faith. But what does the Torah say, our Bible say, about why Abraham was chosen? Look at the bottom of page one. God says, For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. What's essential is not only your faith. Faith is part of it. What's essential is what you do with that faith. That's why the Jewish Bible has a verse which says the righteous shall live by their faith. It's not just what you feel inside your heart. That internal faith has to lead to a transformed life. And God says to a about Abraham, I know about Abraham, because he has the proper faith, he will teach his children to follow the way of God by doing proper actions. And then God says, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God says, why were you chosen, Abraham? Not because you simply believed, but because you obeyed. On the next page, page 2, God says, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. Not simply because Abraham had faith. That was the starting point. What was critical, the Bible shows you, is that Abraham actualized that faith by following God, obeying God, listening to God, and walking in the ways of God. Okay. Um, 
forgive me, I have a new camera and I updated my movie editing software and uh, I'm still working on some adjustments to try to get it to work properly. Okay, now Paul, in Galatians chapter 3. Now for the, for the New Testament, I'm just going to use the King James Bible. <clears throat> okay. Now what happened was the Galatians were being taught. This is not Jews either. Because if they were Jews, they would have already been circumcised. But there were um, some uh, Pharisee Jews that were converted to Christianity and they were coming around to the Gentile churches that Paul had been forming and teaching them that they must be circumcised. So Paul's answering to this and he's saying, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's a good question. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, there must have been some healing or something going on, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Okay, so now he's referring to the gospel going to the Gentiles, being preached to Abraham in ancient times when God said, through you shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So let's just take a look at that first. Okay, so this is uh, from... Genesis chapter 15. Now this is before the circumcision was given. And this was uh, just after the battle on the plains of Sodom. Uh, when the uh, priest Melchizedek had blessed Abraham and he paid him tithes. So um, he gave him a tenth. So then, right after that battle, then Abraham, uh, well, this is where this begins, chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy reward shall be exceedingly great. And Abram, Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? seeing I go hence childless. And he that shall be a possessor of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is to, me, is to be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. 
And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, O oh Lord God, how will I know that I will inherit it? So now, here's where it things change, okay? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness because he believed them. He said, okay, I will have an heir. It will happen. But then he doubted. He said, how will I know? How will I know? Um, and and that, this is now when God says, I am the Lord. Uh, and he, okay, and he said, O oh Lord God, how will I know that I shall inherit it? This is in verse 8. And he said to him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat three years old, and a ram three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So now he's going to enter into a covenant. Okay? So God is going to, um, instead of Abraham just believing God and believing his promise, He's now demanding, he, he didn't demand a covenant, but now as God is going to enter into a covenant of assurance that, okay, that it is more sure through the covenant. Okay. And he took him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each half over against the other, but the, the he did not divide the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. And it came to pass, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread, even a great darkness, fell upon him. And he said to, and he said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. But thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And in the fourth generation they shall come back here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. Okay, so this is what Paul is referring to. And he's saying, okay, now, Abram believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. If he would have just stopped there, there would not have been this darkness and this... Uh, um, dream of dread and this um, covenant process, you see. So this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, you had miracles performed among you. You believed in Jesus. You had the Holy Spirit poured out into you. Why are you going to turn now to things of the flesh to try to find God when you've already found him. So this is what Paul is pointing towards here. Okay. Now, even as now we'll go back to Galatians where what Paul is talking about. Even as Abel, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, know you therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, 
Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So where is this written? Okay. Now, uh, the, Paul is, um, he's not saying that the law is a bad thing. But he's saying there is a curse in the law for somebody who does, does not do all the law and keep it. So if you bind yourself to the law, now that you have found the Spirit, now you're going to turn and get circumcised and promise to keep this law. You're going to enter into this covenant when you already have the Spirit of God. So now you're going to enter into this covenant and become cursed if you disobey the law. You see? So this is what he's telling them, that you can't, don't do this. This is not the way to go. Um, and I'll explain more to you about this because uh, Rabbi Skolbeck is, he's, trying to explain to you what Paul is teaching, but he doesn't know what Paul is teaching, obviously. And then he goes on to teach what Paul is teaching, and he's not teaching the Torah. It's, it's kind of strange, but that's what he's doing. He's, he's tearing Paul down and then saying, you start with faith, and your faith leads you to keep the law. And that is exactly what Paul teaches. But the rabbi accuses Paul of teaching something else. And then he starts teaching something that Paul teaches and not teaching the Torah. I'll show you this. It's kind of weird. but So that was Paul's position to the Galatians. All right. So now if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 27. Say about verse 11 where Moshe, Moses, charged the people the same day saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Uh, Simon, Levi, Yeh Yehuda, Yisachar, Yosef, and Binyamin. They shall stand on Mount Gerizim, and these shall stand on Mount Ebel for the curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So there's a blessing and a curse in the law. Okay? So if we look at the curse, okay, um, just. Uh, Starting in verse 16, curses is he that dishonors his father or his mother. Curse, and all the people shall say, Amen. Curses is he that removes his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Curses is he that makes the blind go astray on the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. And you go down through all of this list of curses, and the last curse, verse 26, Curses is he that confirms not the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Uh, the law, that's the word, the Hebrew word is Torah. Curses is he that confirms not the Torah, the words of the Torah, to do them. All of the Torah. Not just some of the Torah. All of the Torah. Okay? Now I'm going to read another thing to you. Let's take a look at Numbers chapter 19. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying to Aaron, saying, This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to B'nai Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer, faultless, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. And you shall give her unto Eleazar the, Co the Kohen, 
and she shall be brought forth without the camp, and she shall be slain before his face. And Eleazar the Kohan, Kohan, that's priest, shall take care of shall take of her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood towards the front of the tent of meeting seven times. And the heifer shall be burnt in his sight, her skin and her flesh and her blood and her dung shall be burnt. And the Kohen, the priest, shall take the cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the Kohen shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he may come into the camp, and the Kohen shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burns her shall wash his clothes in water, and bathe his flesh in water, and shall be unclean until evening. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer, and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of B'nai Israel, that's sons of Israel, for a water of sprinkling. It is a purification from sin. Okay? And there are many occasions like that in the Torah. Okay? So... You have these lists of cursings and these blood fear purifications in the Torah. This is something this rabbi seems to forget. Okay? So now Paul is saying, uh, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone that continues not in all things, all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay? And it's not only the blood rituals, it's, 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 um, there are so many laws and so many things. And now if you break a law, it's not enough just to repent in the Torah. It's not enough just to repent. You have to go to the priest. You have to bring an offering. It's not just flowers. It's a part of your repentance. Okay? Now, as far as Paul teaching the law to forget the law, he is not teaching to forget the law. Um, the law, okay, he goes on to say, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. So the law is a doing. It's not faith. Okay? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. There are curses in the law. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. That's another concept that gets a little complicated. But um, Christ said that he came to fulfill the law. So he fulfilled the law in that making all these blood offerings prophecy. They're all prophecy about Christ. Okay? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the Paschal Lamb. It's, it's, it's prophecy about Christ. So now there's still a repentance. And there's still a keeping of God's law. But the ritualistic aspect of it has ended. That's why there's no temple. Where's the temple? Without the temple and without the Levitical priesthood, you are not keeping the Torah. It's very simple. It's, it's just not being done. Because you have to do all of it. 
not some of it, all of it. So with Christ and faith and the keeping of the law, you can do all of it. Because the, 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 the temple sacrifice part is, has been fulfilled through accepting Christ as he as him fulfilling that fulfilling it once for all time <clears throat> now as far as uh, um, you know a lot of Christians don't even get this but if we take a look at Romans chapter 8 or ch Romans chapter 7 um, Paul gives a, a a better uh, explanation of how he fits law with grace because he doesn't say get rid of doing the law <laughs> he he there's a there's another way of looking at law how law and grace work together okay so he says <clears throat> Um, know you not, brothers, for I speak to them that know the law, how the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But as, if the husband dies, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Therefore, my brothers, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another even him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit to God. Now how does that work? For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Because when you break the law, then you are worthy of death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, no. I had not known sin, but by the law. For if... For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manners of concus concupiscence, coveting. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So the commandment came, be, before I had no commandment, I was alive with sin. But now the commandment came, and because of my sin, I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be to death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by the commandment slew me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good, was then that which was made, was then that which is good made death to me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So 
it makes the sin even worse because the sin took advantage of the commandment to kill me. Uh, this is speaking of a demonic force. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. <laughs> okay? So, um, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. If then I do that which I don't want, I consent to the law that it is good. Because it's because of the law that I don't want to do it. Right? But for some reason I do it. Now then, it is no more I that does it, but sin that dwells in me that does it. Because I want to do the law, but the sin in me does not want to do the law. Okay? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And he's talking, uh, he's not talking about just being a good person. He's talking about perfection in the law, which is uh, the law is like the righteousness of God, the complete law. So to do that is easier said than done. Okay? For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil, which I would not, that I do. When it really boils down to it, that's true. Okay? Now, if I do that, that I do, that I would not, if I do that, that I don't want to do, it is no longer I doing it, but sin that dwells in me is doing it. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So there's a problem here with me, not with the law. So the law is good, but I am not good. All right? For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law that's in my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I mean, I'm, I'm in a really tough space here. Oh, thank God, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So now, um, this is not the end of the matter, okay? This is uh, um, coming to a position of realizing what you are and where you are as far as the law of God is concerned and not thinking that you're keeping it when you're not actually keeping it. Like if you lie, if you steal, if you there's so many things that even a slight little lie and you are under the law, you are worthy of punishment. It's, it's uh, and it it goes so deeply into your being that you are not perfect. Like everybody says it, nobody's perfect. Well, if you're not perfect, you're not keeping the law. There's something about you that's not keeping the law. Okay? 
So this is what Paul's talking about. It's about perfection in the law. Okay? So now he goes into, okay, well, so what do we do now? Now that we find ourselves in this position, what do we do? Now that you have, I, I thank God through Jesus Christ, so then with the mind, I serve the law of God. In my heart and my mind, I, I love the law and I serve it, but the flesh does not. Even because Jesus expanded the law, even wanting to sin is sin. Even, even coming into your heart. He said that it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you sin. It's what comes out of your mouth that makes you sin. Because what goes into your mouth goes through your digestive system and leaves your body. What comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. So this is the, this is the problem Paul is talking about and dealing with now okay so now in chapter 8 he goes on and he says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ who walk not who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit so now I'm not under condemnation of the law, and I'm not uh, depressed by the sin in me, because through Christ and through belief in Christ, I have overcome the sin in the flesh. It can't harm me. It can't do anything to me anymore. It's gone. It, it's the sin in me, in my flesh, is powerless against me because I've been forgiven and I'm continually being forgiven. So now that sin is powerless in me, okay, uh, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So now what's that mean? What's it mean to walk after the Spirit? For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is that when I sin, I die. Okay? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So he didn't condemn me. He condemned the sin in my flesh. You see? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So now that we walk after the spirit, we can fulfill the righteousness of God because sin has no power over us. This is what he's getting to. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 
But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. So the spirit that dwells in you now will take over in your body and guide your body to do the law of God. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, where, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, to God, the God of the Tanakh. Okay? The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now he's talking about the final uh, culmination of all things and when the, the, the kingdom of righteousness is fully brought in. Okay. <clears throat> so that's, you know, it goes on more and more. And um, but that's basically Paul's teaching of the law and the spirit. So it's not this thing about replacing the law or replacing the Torah with faith. It's replacing the doing with the believing. The Torah remains the same. It's still the law. But you but you, you don't put your faith in your own ability to do it. You put your faith in God's ability to rise you above it. To to not only do it, but it goes on even further than that. The law is for lawbreakers. It's not for law doers. So if you are doing the law, then you you transcend the law. Which is not that you're doing the things the law condemns, because you're not doing the things the law condemns. The law only condemns sin. It doesn't condemn people who are not sinning. So that's how you transcend the law. So, you know, it, it doesn't just involve belief. There's a lot of Christians that believe that, but it's not, that's, not, that's not correct. The law is still the law, and it's still holy and just. But the faith leads us to not only keep that law but surpass it it's like uh if you're if you're a believing person um i'm sure jews can understand this too if you're a believing person and you're living in a, a, a certain country say and that country has laws you don't concern yourself a lot with the laws of that country do not murder do not steal do not you're not concerned with those laws because you don't do those things. So it's the same kind of thing. It's like, you know, as a, as a God-fearing person, you're already above those kind of laws. You're, you're not, you don't think about those things because it's just below you. You don't do it anyway. Those laws are for the people that do that to be punished. So it's more along those lines than along the lines of erasing the law. So that's um, all I got to say about that. What he's talking about, he's building a straw man. 
He ignores the Torah, which has those kinds of uh, ritualistic ordinances, which are required. He ignores that. And then he turns around and, and, and uses what he's learned from Christians to call it Jewish and say, well, now you can use faith to keep the law. But you can't be under the Old Covenant and not perform everything in the Old Covenant. You have to be in the New Covenant to be able to keep the law by faith. You can't do it without Jesus. Alright, thank you for watching. Don't forget to share this video anywhere you can to help spread the word if you feel that what I'm saying is correct. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.